Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is David Schwartz. I'm the Vice President of Public Policy and Federal Affairs at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I welcome you all to today's discussion on Medicaid eligibility, excuse me, redeterminations. Uh, in January of 2020, the United States Department of Health and Human Services declared the COVID-19 public health emergency. Shortly thereafter, in March, Congress passed a law requiring states to provide continuous coverage for Medicaid enrollees during the public health emergency in order to receive enhanced Medicaid funding. This unprecedented public health crisis disproportionately impacted people of color and laid bare deep societal inequities. As our nation faced significant job losses and economic hardships, Medicaid served as a lifeline to many in providing access to healthcare. As a result, Medicaid enrollment nationally swelled by more than 25% from February 2020 to July of 2022 to meet the needs of individuals across the country. While this has resulted in historic coverage gains, many individuals are at risk of losing their coverage as states resume routine renewal processes once the COVID PHE officially ends. Since states have not removed people from their Medicaid roles over the last two and a half years, there are many who are currently enrolled who may no longer meet eligibility requirements. The Department of Health and Human Services estimates that as many as 15 million Medicaid enrollees nationwide could be disenrolled, including approximately 7 million who could still be eligible. Medicaid eligible individuals could lose coverage for procedural reasons, which are preventable, such as not having up-to-date contact information in the system. It is imperative that enrollees are provided with the crucial information they need about the redetermination process so that those who are still eligible for Medicaid are not denied for procedural reasons and those who are no longer eligible experience a smooth transition into the marketplace or another form of coverage. While the timing of the end of the public health emergency is uncertain, what is certain is the resumption of Medicaid eligibility rede redeterminations will be an enormous undertaking. It will require collaboration across stakeholder groups to maintain continuity of coverage for everyone. As we think through these challenges, Care First is thrilled to convene this panel of experts today to discuss ways that managed care organizations, state Medicaid agencies, and commercial market insurers can partner to minimize coverage losses once redeterminations resume. In terms of housekeeping, we have closed captioning available. And while we are accepting questions through the Q&A feature on Zoom, we may not have enough time to get to everyone's questions. If we don't answer your question during the webinar, someone from, excuse me, someone from our uh, public policy and government affairs team at Care First will follow up with an answer. With that, I wanna get, get to the business of the day and introduce you to our moderator, Care First's Executive Vice President of Government Programs, Wanda Anefru Bay. Wanda. Thank you, David. Um, it's always a pleasure to be in the same setting with you. Thank um, you. As David mentioned, my name is Wanda Anefru Bay. I'm the Executive Vice President of Government Programs at Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield. And I am so thrilled to be leading this important dialogue with you today. You know, carriers such as Care First that are both managed care organizations and individual market insurers have a critical role in keeping individuals covered during periods of transition. MCOs and individual market insurers are partners in this process along, <clears throat> alongside the states and the federal government. And it will take collaboration and discussion across all stakeholders to promote continued healthcare coverage and limit the disruption to consumers. As we are all aware, the public health emergency has been renewed several times. Although it remains difficult to predict when the public health emergency will end and when Medicaid eligibility redeterminations will begin, 
the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has committed to giving states 60 days notice to ending the public health emergency. Once the public health emergency officially ends, states will have a 14 month period to complete all renewals, which includes 12 months to initiate all redeterminations and two months to complete all pending actions. We are all aware that our strategies will need to be ever evolving to best respond to the needs of our enrollees. To discuss the opportunities for partnership that will be necessary during the unwinding process, we are joined by three panelists each with a passion for keeping our community covered. As I pose questions to the panel, I will ask for a particular panelist to lead the response, but I encourage all panelists to participate and respond to each question. I'll let them introduce themselves to you and share a brief thought on their connection to the topic we are discussing today. Jennifer, Randy, Debbie, the floor is yours. Good morning. Um, thank you, Wanda, for being here. It's such a pleasure to be here um, with Randy and with Debbie uh, to talk about the various strategies that we can all employ uh, when it comes to the Medicaid eligibility redeterminations and the continuous coverage unwinding. I'm looking forward to sharing our thoughts about how we here in Virginia are going to be addressing this um, significant undertaking, as well as learning from my peers and sharing information with the rest of the group today. Randy, Good Wanda. Hi, okay, Debbie. Debbie. Hi. Hi, my name is Debbie Rupert, and I'm the Executive Director for the Office of Eligibility Services with the Maryland Department of Health. And I, just like Jennifer, are very excited to hear about what other of our key partners are doing and where we can learn and best practices and look forward to sharing with you what we have done in Maryland to help uh, retain and maintain enrollment um, through our continuous growth. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Randy Pate. Um, I am great to see everybody, great to be here on this panel. Really excited about the topic and the information uh, we're gonna be sharing today. I, my previous background is I've served as the Deputy Administrator and Director for the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight at CMS. Uh, I was there for four years uh, up until uh, late 2020, um, or yeah, and uh, in that capacity, you know, that's the center within CMS that oversees the health insurance exchanges and sort of the policy around the Affordable Care Act with the premium tax credits and, and all that type of thing. So, um, you know, this is, I think, a big piece of, you know, where folks are going to turn to for coverage, you know, if they are determined and eligible during this process. So great to be here today and, and happy to Happy to be here. Thank you uh, all. I really appreciate that introduction. Now, the total Medicaid and CHIP enrollment has increased by over 18.7 million enrollees since February of 2020. That is an enormous number. Debbie, as the Executive Director of the Office of Eligibility at MDH, I'd like to start with you. Can you speak generally about the impact of the significant increase in Medicaid enrollment during the ongoing public emergency or better known as PHE? Thank you, Wanda. Um, Maryland is just like the many other states. Uh, when this began, we had 1.4 million recipients and we're now at 1.7, pushing to 1.8. And that's a huge 300,000 plus recipients that, that we continue to provide services for. In Maryland, we're very fortunate to have nine MCO partners 
So we've been able to share our enrollment over uh, nine plans, which um, in, in Maryland has truly helped us that we haven't had to burden one or two plans like some of my other states who uh, are very limited in the contract of providers. So we were very fortunate in that aspect and to be able to continue to provide preventive and chronic care services along with case management services for our recipients. Maryland, we're very hands-on partners with our MCOs, and so the benefit is that is strength in numbers, and so all of our health plans we share renewal information with, they do outreach, we share uh, return addresses, and so along with our MCOs and our contracts uh, that we have with the local health department and Department of Social Services, um, we've had many people uh, with their hands in this pot to help us with this continuous uh, coverage. In Maryland, we didn't stop our efforts. We continue to do renewals, and we're very glad that we did. We hear some of the hardships that some of our other states are experiencing that they may have lost touch with the individuals. We continued our Medicaid outreach through the entire process, which has allowed us to stay connected individuals are aware that the renewals were done. We just extended their coverage in the event that they didn't complete the renewals. In Maryland, 86% of our recipients are in our managed care services, again, which supports our many partners that have helped us provide care. In Maryland, we also achieve a 55% auto renewal uh, in renewals, which allows us to take off 55% that we're able to renew through electronic uh, uh, services that we don't have to require the individual to do the, the manual renewal on their own. So we're very fortunate to consistently achieve that high auto renewal rate and always looking at opportunities to increase that number. So of our renewals, less than 50% of our applicants actually have to do something. And what I have mentioned earlier is that we share the files with our MCOs for outreach from their outreach department to the recipients and also our local health departments to assist in outreach to those 45% of our remaining population that may have to do a renewal. So um, that's the course that we've taken in Maryland. We're very fortunate. None of us knew in the beginning whether this was going to be a month or two months. And so we opted to stay straight on the course. And it would be uh, good to hear um, from Jennifer if she has any feedback about the course that Virginia took. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate the question. Um, in terms of the course that Virginia took, there has been a, a strong emphasis on getting as many consumers as possible uh, renewed through the ex parte process. Um, so while I can't speak directly for our Medicaid agency, um, that has been their emphasis and their focus. A lot of the areas that we have been working on through um, this last year and into the next years through the use of our Navigator and our assister networks, amplifying the message that consumers really need to come and make sure that they have correct address information on file and making sure that our Medicaid agency has the ability to contact uh, these recipients when the Medicaid redeterminations do start. We all know how important that is and how important it is that you know, consumers are getting those renewal letters when they do start to come out and that they are understanding and aware of the importance of getting that information back to us. Um, it really has been a, a strong effort in ensuring that there's you know, education, uh, strong education to our populations and making sure they understand what is coming and, and what to expect when that does come. Um, so, and as we are moving forward into 2023, which will be our transition year here in Virginia, it's really aligning that messaging about what to expect with the renewals um, if they do happen. You know, right now we're expecting that the, the continuous coverage unwinding or the end of the public health emergency could happen in April, but it, it could be delayed even further beyond that. We, we just don't know. So it's really educating consumers about what the impacts of the ending of the public health emergency are and where they can go to get coverage because that is going to shift for our Virginia consumers 
in this upcoming year. And Jennifer, just to add, you, you raised a great point about our partnerships. In Maryland, we have partnered with the Department of Unemployment and the IRS. We recognize that when someone loses their uh, employment and applies for benefits, that's also another opportunity for them to select whether or not they would like to apply for Medicaid benefits. And we did the same thing with individuals following their tax statements when they're Tax, Maryland tax form, they're able to uh, also check that they would like to apply for Medicaid benefits. And so that was a great point when you talked about your navigators and assisters. And in Maryland, we're very fortunate to have a, a, a partnership with our um, Maryland market. Um, it's our system of entry. And so uh, individuals flow through Medicaid. And then if they don't qualify for Medicaid, because we are in one system with our, our Maryland marketplace, they have the opportunity to smoothly transition to other qualified health plans. And so we're very glad that we have developed a streamlined one-step process that gets them to all aspects. As we know, a lot of our, uh, our, our population transitions on and off Medicaid. And so to keep that uh, streamlined process, uh, we work very hard to, to main the, maintain uh, those processes. That's good. You know, um, CMS has emphasized the importance of stakeholders partnering together to prepare for the resumption of Medicaid eligibility redetermination. In particular, CMS has provided guidance allowing states to permit MCOs to update beneficiary contact information. Randy, I'd like to start with you. Um, what other examples of effective partnership have you seen and how can these partnerships be enhanced? Yeah, I mean, I think just taking a step back for, for a second and thinking about sort of how we got here, you know, I think that's always important in these discussions. Yes. You know, what states are facing. I mean, uh, when you look at what Congress passed out of the, the PHE, um, you know, this expansion was always intended to be temporary, right? And so I think that's important to keep in mind. And when CMS talks about things like presumption of normal operations, I mean, you know, I think, Deborah, you guys are ahead of the curve when you look at a lot of states. Um, unfortunately, I think, you know, for some of them, it's going to be anything but regular operation when you know, the sort of volumes uh, that we're expecting come in, uh, you know, during the unwinding. Uh, so, you know, I think, you know, this next year, whenever this happens, you know, some states are going to be in some unprecedented territory in terms of, you know, their workforces, you know, their systems, their IT systems, um, you know, and, and we've already talked about the contact information, you know, obviously, you know, folks in Medicaid, a lot of them are very transient, you know, they should be able to text people, that's a primary um, means of, uh, of communication, and we, and we could talk about that, but, you know, I think, um, you know, I was looking at the Urban Institute, they put out, um, you know, some a report last week, you know, the majority of folks that fall into this unwinding, you know, it seems have already moved on to private coverage, a lot of them, they may have employer sponsored coverage, they may have CHIP. Um, for most people in this situation, it's going to, you, you're going to have a redetermination, and then they're going to reach out to somebody who may not even know that they had Medicaid coverage, they've, you know, they may have, you know, already sort of moved on. So you think about things like looking to trusted data sources out there to try to target and prioritize people who may have other coverage, you know, already versus those likely to go insured, which is a smaller number. You know, and then I think about states that have their own health insurance exchanges already, you know, some of them are in a probably a better position, maybe like Maryland, where there's that tighter integration, uh, you know, between the Medicaid agency and the um, and the exchange to sort of provide a seamless handoff when, when folks become eligible for ACA subsidies. The, the FFE, the federal exchange, has some difficulties in this area. Um, there's really not time, you know, I've talked to folks, there's really not time to fix that um, for this PHE, but, you know, I think more states in the long run ought to look to do what Virginia's done in terms of moving to their own state-based exchange so they can really focus on, you know, providing a better integration. Um, and then the other just sort of piece I'll mention real quickly is 
remember that for the population below 150% federal poverty, um, it, there's a SEP, a special enrollment period, that is basically monthly. So if you think about people, you know, coming off of Medicaid coverage because of their income, you know, a lot of them are going to fall into that category. So there's really more than one bite at the apple to reach out to those folks. Um, you know, there's a, you know, multiple months that they'd be eligible for a special enrollment period. So, you know, why states, you know, like Maryland, it appears, you know, and, and Virginia have been planning for this for months. They knew this was temporary. Not all states are in the same position. So all players right now should definitely be, you know, providers, plans, consumer groups. You know, we talked about assisters and navigators, talked about exchanges. We also need to talk about agents and brokers. We need to talk about web brokers. That's something I think that CMS could really, um, really help to start, you know, uh, sort of rolling out opportunities for those partners. Um, you know, I, I think the partnership with the MCOs is great. You know, I think they've gotten very good, especially the MCOs that are also in the exchange. You know, they've gotten very good at, at you know, at that handoff between exchange and, and Medicaid. So they're already sort of well situated. But I think the other carriers in these markets ought to be included as well. Um, you know, and I, and I will go back to one of the most effective you know, public private partnerships I've ever been a part of was the creation of enhanced direct enrollment, which is allowing web brokers and insurance companies to directly enroll people in ACA coverage, you know, without having to go through the exchange website. So you know, over half of the ACA enrollments last year um, through the open enrollment period were agent or broker assisted. And so, you know, although the numbers aren't official for this year, you know, when you look at the, the, you know, the big special enrollment opportunity that occurred in the individual market um, last year because of the enhanced subsidies. And, and, you know, the Biden administration is saying, you know, there's a 40% increase in ACA enrollment during that period of time. Uh, it's, it's very likely the majority of those folks came through, whether it be a web broker or an agent of broker assisted enrollment. So it seems to me that, you know, those folks probably already have the contact information they already have the list of people, you know, they ought to be being leveraged, um, I think, you know, in a, in a major way um, to make sure that they're getting the targeted list of the folks to reach out to. And I think, you know, both the states can do that. You know, they can work with the web brokers, they can work with the agents and brokers, and I think the federal government can do the same thing. Great. And Randy, oh. Just to add, so um, with all those partners, my big concern is um, having lots of individuals shift in their months of uh, workload because we have to be very sensitive that whoever comes in in one month that you have the staffing to be able to support them in years to come. So we don't wanna cause panic or confusion. And so that's why in Maryland, we're, we're putting out a simple communication, just advising them, make sure your address is up to date so that we can contact them and not create that panic that may result in 200,000 people applying in one month and 5,000 in the next month. So we want to keep that smooth enrollment so that we'll be able to maintain it for many years to come. That's yeah, absolutely. Good. Well, and you don't want, you don't want a situation where you get 200,000 people in in July and then the next July, you get the same thing and the next July, you know, it's, it's you not You can't going. sustain it for years to come, you know, with your staffing. And so that's why we're trying to uh, uh, weight balance, which CMS has said, you know, some states, it, you know, that you could do a balancing of your enrollment so that it's more of a steady flow. We've done that in our non-MAGI population in Maryland, where we had some peaks and valleys. It was an opportunity to combine their food stamps and other associated benefits to try to, to better balance so that we can continue to uh, support for many years to come. That's good. Um, you know, speaking of that, the Urban Institute estimates that 15.8 million people could lose Medicaid coverage during this unwinding period. And CMS anticipates that half of all those losing coverage will be children. It is also estimated that of the 15.8 million people that could lose their coverage, 
around 6.8 million will likely still be eligible. Jennifer, I'd like to start this question with you. What mitigation strategies, what other mitigation strategies should stakeholders take to ensure that those who are eligible for Medicaid can retain their coverage and those who are no longer eligible can transition to other sources of coverage, such as the individual market? Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question, Wanda. Um, you know, as I had indicated earlier in response to Debbie, for us really educating consumers about the importance of keeping their contact information updated is so critically important. When we talk about those 6.8 million consumers that could potentially be redetermined and eligible for Medicaid, but still technically be eligible, that really is, you know, due to the procedural denial process. Um, and so we want to make sure that consumers are able to receive the information that they need to maintain their coverage. So here in Virginia, we are working on collaborating um, with our various stakeholders, including our state Medicaid agencies, our Division of Social Services. Um, we're looking uh, and working closely and have meetings uh, upcoming in January um, with a lot of our carriers as well so that we can continue to collaborate on ways to best get this messaging to our consumers. And then as we are preparing to transition and launch our own website, ensuring that we have information that's on the website that speaks to consumers. Um, our navigator and our sister networks are getting information on a weekly basis and we are working actively on expanding um, our engagement with our broker community so that they too can help um, with this, um, you know, with the continuous coverage unwinding and helping us get the message out there. Now, when it comes to um, continuing coverage or ensuring that coverage is continued for consumers that are determined and eligible and getting them into appropriate coverage on the exchange, um, we're looking really closely at as we are building our system and as we are building through our transition, making sure that we're able to identify the right data that we need so that we can contact consumers and make sure that they know that they can enroll. We are looking at building out our consumer assistance call center and making sure that we can appropriately um, integrate that and um, coordinate that with our state Medicaid agencies so that we are able to provide the most um, or the best service possible um, for our consumers and really looking at strategies where we can utilize data to identify which populations are most likely uh, to fall into this, um, into the bucket of losing Medicaid coverage, but then potentially being eligible for exchange coverage and then conducting proactive outreach to them to help encourage them to, to come onto the platform and enroll in coverage. Okay. Um, did you have anything to add, Debbie? I was just going to say, um, you know, we, we know that we lose recipients because they may miss that renewal. And I was very glad that CMS granted some um, um, opportunities for the MCOs to reach out to individuals after they lose their coverage, you know, for a period of time. We know that most of the time, you know, individuals do come back within the la within the three months, and thank goodness we do have retro eligibility where we can make sure that there's no gaps in their service. And in Maryland, uh, when a recipient is disenrolled, they go back to their MCO that they were before for continuation of care, and so, you know, we do take advantage, and we know that it's going to happen, and we're very glad that we have infrastructure in place to continue that outreach after they have disenrolled to get them to come back in. So our efforts doesn't stop once they are, uh, they miss the redetermination or uh, disenrolled, we continue that. And we, we capture the reason for the disenrollment so our health plans will be able to know the reason that it was due to non-renewal and not overscaled. We don't wanna reach out to those people that really didn't qualify. And so it's capturing the correct data so that all of our efforts can be successful to get the individual to come back. Okay, that's um, good. 
Um, to your point about educating enrollees, because states have not redetermined Medicaid eligibility and removed or removed individuals from their Medicaid roles in over two and a half years, there are many individuals who have never had to deal with redetermination processes before. Debbie, um, what strategies or best practices do you believe are critical to educating enrollees on what is to come? But it really hasn't been an issue in Maryland because we continued our practice. We haven't, you know, everybody has had a renewal. And even if they haven't had a renewal, we continue to do outreach. And so on the months that I look at, you know, we had a 55% auto renewal and there may have been, you know, a, a percentage of individuals that didn't come back to do the renewal. But when I look at uh, the, the way that we track our enrollment, I can see that we've been able to get 45% of those individuals that didn't enroll to come back. And so there's been a very small population. Uh, you know, we've maintained our roles. We have brought on new individuals, but those new individuals have gone through renewal cycles since we continued. So I don't think that is as large of an issue as many states in trying to educate about renewals because we continued and then continued to do outreach and you know try to get them to complete and and, and many efforts you know we offer in person assistance and uh, call center we um, uh, telephone you know those many outlets uh, where individuals can apply so we've made it very easy for mobile. Uh, for them to come back and do their renewals. Okay, excellent. Um, Jennifer, Randy, did you have anything you wanted to add? Well, you know, I think you know, uh, Debbie is just proving once again, Maryland is the A student here. You know, they've done a great job. I think, you know, some other states may not be in that position and, and they may be caught a little bit more in behind the eight ball here, you know, for, for those states, you know, I've heard about things like making sure going back through your forms and notices, simplifying those things. And I think, you know, there's some best practices that are out there around that, you know, making them as, as straightforward as possible for folks as they're going through the process. You know, I also go back to information sharing. You know, I think that's so important with all this. I know there, you know, likely there's some legal barriers and things like that. But I think, you know, when you, when you think about, well, maybe that individual maybe at one point was enrolled through the exchange or through a private carrier or whatever get that information, try to pre-populate as much as you can, you know, for the, for the person, whether they're being redetermined, you know, or whether they're coming to the exchange, make sure that all the blanks are filled in for the information that all the different players already have, right, you know, as much as possible, which is, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, but, you know, I, I think it's uh, real important to do that to the extent you can. Yeah, that, that's um, really helpful. Um, so let's talk about vulnerable populations. Enrollees with limited English proficiency are at increased risk of encountering challenges with completing the renewal process. Additionally, some of these individuals may encounter additional challenges through enrolling in the exchange if they have never engaged with it before and are determined no longer eligible for Medi Medicaid. Um, Jennifer, uh, how do you ensure that these individuals receive the information they need to engage with the renewal process and enrollment in the exchange in a way that is accessible and culturally competent? Um, thank you for that question. That's probably one of the things that I am most excited to talk about. But um, one of the strategies that um, I, I found across my career and that I, I feel like has been especially um, helpful here in, in Virginia is to really identify and target and work with communities, especially language, um, limited English proficiency communities, um, working with them in ways in working with them where they already are. So, you know, this is going, you know, to the where they live, work, go to school, um, conducting a lot of outreach in areas like, you know, working through schools. We 
leverage and are increasing currently um, a wide base of community networks and community partners um, so that we can continue to, to reach our, uh, our targeted populations um, kind of at a high level, obviously, un uninsured and underinsured consumers, but then those that are at risk of Medicaid eligibility redetermination. But um, leveraging community partnerships, really making sure that those places where um, our targeted populations are, are going to be going anyway, accessing services anyway, that we are at the forefront of, of their mind and that they know who the Virginia Health Benefit Exchange is and how we can help consumers and where consumers can get additional help and support. Again, be that through our call center when that launches later in 2023 or you know, through our navigator and assister network or, or through our broker community, we um, are really striving to, to reach consumers where they are. And I think one of you know, my favorite examples is you know, one of our navigator entities that partners in the Northern part of the state, but people SOS, um, you know, they have these wonderful trusted relationships with family owned businesses. And they, these are businesses where um, that traditionally have high levels of uninsured employees and they actually go to those businesses and conduct enrollment events um, you know they're on nights and weekends and work directly with those employees to help them maintain coverage so we're looking um, when the public health emergency ends um, you know looking at being able to expand those types of enrollment events and really again targeting populations where they are in a way that is most meaningful to them. And that's gonna be different for different communities. We found that um, you know, older populations, they, they prefer to get their information you know, through more traditional means, through you know, newspaper advertising, through actual handouts. You know, younger generations are a little more savvy in terms of technology and get a lot more of their information you know, off social media and online. So, you know, breaking out all of our different target populations and those who are at risk and are considered more vulnerable um, and identifying different strategies based off of what those you know, population needs are to make sure that we're appropriately um, educating and informing them about the changes that are coming and how they can access coverage on the exchange and how they can get help. Good. Randy, Debbie, did you have anything that you wanted to add? I was just going to say, I agree with Jennifer, um, you know, boots on the street. We have increased our grant funding to our local health departments who also do those community uh, events and extended their hours, uh, evenings and Saturdays, recognizing that many of the population work. We have a, a large migrant population with farming and other things. And so we're, we're, we really try hard to find those tools to engage. Um, and, and again, it's extending hours for hours of operation with work schedules, uh, being in the, the area where they are to provide that hands-on person uh, support is, is how we focused it in Maryland. Okay, that's really, really good. Um, so for, federal government guidance. In order to help ensure a smooth process, the Biden administration has provided key flexibilities surrounding the timing of unwinding activities, templates for state planning and reporting, a communications toolkit available in seven languages, and temporary waivers to enable states to streamline Medicaid renewals. Another piece of guidance many stakeholders are awaiting is a ruling from the Federal Communications Commission on whether plans may contact Medicaid members via text messaging and their eligibility and enrollment. Randy, what additional flexibilities do you believe are important to the federal government for the for the federal government to provide. 
Right. So, I mean, I, I think the, I already talked about text messaging before. I think the FCC guidance is really crucial and they need to put that guidance out quickly so that everybody can plan, you know, and be ready for that um, to be able to use text messages to reach out. Um, and I know that, you know, it's, uh, that's moving. Hopefully it gets done really quickly. Um, but, you know, I, I go back to, you know, looking at not just the MCOs, but also the individual market carriers, you know, that are in the, in the markets in these different states, the, um, you know, the agents and brokers, the web brokers, make sure that everybody has access, not only to the list of folks to target, you know, who are fall into the category of maybe, you know, being um, ruled ineligible, but, you know, possibly eligible for exchange coverage, but allow them to do the text message outreach, whatever legally needs to be done to make that happen. And also to pre-populate as much as possible to have that person's information, you know, as it was most recently known, you know, in their application. So when they show up, you know, to the exchange, maybe, you know, some of their information is already in there. I think something else that's really important, whether it be the federal government or the state government uh, working with partners is to share some granular data on the exchange side with the, with the states and with hopefully with the plans and the, you know, and the brokers, all the folks involved, you know, numbers of calls to the call center by month, you know, like demographic breakdowns as much as you can offer on enrollments, who's coming in and, and maybe who's not. Numbers on people, you know, starting the application but not able to finish it. Where are they getting hung up in the process? All those types of things. And I, and I think it's gonna take adjustment, you know, on the fly during this next period when this happens over that year period to figure out how to make changes so that you're removing barriers to folks, you're not, you know, you're not sort of leaving whole demographics out, you know, but because they're confused about some aspect of the application or, or something like that, you know, all of these things are going to be really important, and it's going to take a lot of coordination and information sharing to pull it off. And I, you know, I hope that whatever legally has to be done, you know, at the federal level, but and you know, I know the there's an effort now on this FCC thing that they're going to Congress to see if they can get you know, some sort of waiver or something like that. Maybe they could think of a package, you know, of, of things just to make sure that everybody knows that they can have access to the data. Because as, as you know, you know, the carriers, you already have access to a lot of the sensitive data and you're, it's HIPAA protected. You know, you, you already have the information. Just make sure that everyone's able to share it and use it effectively in this, in this situation. That's a, a really good point. Um, Debbie, Jennifer, um, what other flexibilities do you think the federal government can um, provide in their guidance? Well, I think they have created the vehicle for us to uh, look for or to apply for many flexibilities. You know, uh, during COVID, uh, we didn't have to record our telephone uh, applications that were taken by eligibility workers. We were able to waive the signatures uh, part for our inmate uh, process that where we go into the prisons to do outreach. So I think that it has allowed us many flexibilities that CMS has offered us already that we could apply for to be successful in Maryland has taken, you know, telephone, telephonic uh, um, medicine, you know, uh, we have taken uh, advantage of many of those uh, um, uh, waivers that have been offered. That's really good. That's uh, good to hear. Um, Jennifer, um, Virginia's transition to a state-based exchange will be completed in the fall of 2023 for coverage effective in 2024. Given the public health emergency is expected to end at some point uh, next year, and once it does end, the states will have a total of 14 months to complete all renewals. How is the Virginia Health Benefit Exchange preparing to potentially go live during the unwinding process. In general, how best should exchanges position themselves to assist individuals determined no uh, de individuals determined no longer eligible for Medicaid? 
Thank you. That's a great question. Um, and it is certainly one that, you know, we, we are taking into close consideration and I think talk about every single day is, you know, what are the impacts of the end of the public health emergency going to have on our transition? Um, you know, from an implementation perspective, um, we all feel that, you know, it, it is most important to keep our transition as simple and as straightforward. So we're really leaning on um, a, a lot of what I have discussed here in this panel, which would be more traditional methodologies to um, address, you know, our, our populations or to reach our populations, which are through, you know, more traditional outreach and education um, so that we are able to focus on a, a very clean transition and a transition that is really providing a superior consumer experience. Once we do transition, then we have the opportunity and the flexibility to really look at other um, other ways that we can, you know, do things kind of like Randy had spoken about, you know, pre-populating applications or things like that. Like we, we will have a lot more options and opportunities to serve the, the residents of the Commonwealth much, much differently than, than we have um, operating on the federal platform. But until that process happens, really our, our main goal is to keep our transition as, as straightforward as possible and as simple as possible to you know, ensure its continued success. So um, you know, one thing that I think exchanges should take into consideration um, in terms of assisting individuals that are no longer eligible for Medicaid is really looking at um, the overlap. That, that's been probably one of the biggest considerations that we've had is the overlap of special enrollment periods that will happen along with the open enrollment period and making sure that consumers are applying for coverage under the right type of um, enrollment period. So if you have a consumer that is Redetermined, say, let's just, you know, say that the public health emergency aid um, does come to an end in April. And so by the time, you know, November comes along during open enrollment, you will have actively consumers that are getting redetermined. And if you have a consumer that is getting redetermined in November of 2023 and they're coming onto the exchange platform, um, making sure they know which enrollment type to, to select if they go and have an open in and apply for open enrollment for coverage. Their coverage won't start until January. However, their coverage may end in December. And so there's the potential for a coverage lapse. So for us, it's really focusing on a lot of education and awareness and making sure that consumers know, you know how to, to reapply, making sure that our navigators and assisters and our brokers know how to assist these consumers with selecting the right type of enrollment period and qualifying life event and that open enrollment, because we also wanna make sure that if a consumer signs up for coverage on the federal marketplace, on the federal platform in 2023, that their coverage is continued forward into 2024. So it's taking actions to really identify potential um, areas where consumers could experience um, a, a lapse in coverage and making sure that we have strategies in place to identify who those consumers are and make sure that you know there's the proper education and awareness there to, to help consumers um, apply for and get the right type of coverage to, to limit or minimize any gaps that could happen. That's uh, really good. Um, Debbie, um, since Randy said that you get the gold star or you get an A for um, <laughs> state-based exchanges, um, what one thing would you pass along in this forum to um, other states that they could do to make a difference in this redetermination process? If there was one thing they could do, what would it be? I, I would say focus strongly on your ex parte process. I, I called it an auto renewal. Jennifer, the formal word is ex parte, but a lot of people don't know what that means. You know, in Maryland, we've studied, uh, you know, we do lots of analysis on what's the number one reason that someone fails an auto renewal? Was it an income data? And so we improved some of our income data, made sure we had the unemployment data like anything that we thought was limiting that auto renewal, because the more you can get the systems 
and your, your uh, identified resources to help you with that, your workload decreases and it creates a much smoother uh, process for the recipient. So, and, and Marilyn, we focus a lot on that. And I would suggest that other states that if, if you're not achieving a, a high percentage of ex parte, that look at some of the reasons and identify those barriers and see if you can get additional data sources uh, to help you get those numbers up. Okay, that is really, really good to hear. Well, it looks like we're about to come to a close. And um, is there anything else that any of you would like to share um, before we close? I just wanna thank you for having this forum because the more we educate our community partners and uh, get feedback, the, the better we are, as I continue to say, there's strengths and numbers. And so thank you for pulling this uh, forum together and inviting us. You're quite welcome. Um, it is our pleasure. It is the pleasure of Care First. Um, so um, thank you all. Thank you to our panelists, our wonderful panelists for offering up their insights and perspectives on Medicaid eligibility redetermination and thoughts on what needs to be done in order to keep our community covered because that is the goal. And I want to thank you and each of you for uh, attending this event today. Um, I know that your schedules are very, very busy, and we appreciate you listening. So have a great day, and thanks for joining us.